and at that time people used to always think that pediatric endocrinology is one branch which is basically very very rare dealing with rare complicated disorders which require cumbersome evaluation and expensive treatment this was a common thing everybody used to say what will pediatric endocrinology do nothing much to be done at this year but when we started seeing patients we were shocked by the way they were being managed and this is one case that dr rashmi and both of us managed it was a very short child diagnosed in 10 years with severe anemia presented for the first time and then at that point of time there was a short stage and was given a blood transfusion diagnosed as a case of celiac disease but unfortunately had developed hiv because of the blood transfusion which happened in that scenario so this was the unfortunate scenario a case which should have been diagnosed at the right time and should have been managed in that perspective or missed in that scenario so we thought what are the problem is it a problem of awareness accessibility or affordability now everybody says it is always a problem of cost so people say cost is a major problem but what is the truth is actually the elephant of the house is awareness if you don't know when should you go where should you go how you should be managed it is difficult once you go direction is there people will help you people will help the patient patient will help themselves but most important is awareness so from there we started our program and 2012 we had the first ppc and lot of people here including all the seniors dr subrato dr rishi everybody was part of that program and since then we have conducted huge number of programs across the region in the country but unfortunately how many physical programs one can do that is a limit to that so we started the advanced programs as well so we moved forward from there to internet media because now internet is available so we started on youtube around 7 years ago and from there we moved forward towards a structured program both on site as well as online and now we have got the application and other things which are happening we have e learning program which has got huge number of subscribers and all of you would have access that this would be something to go forward but problem with uh, youtube is that you can see one video and then you forget about it so if you want to have a systematic learning we started off with this program of medi classes 4 years ago in which we now have a fellowship program and a diploma program a lot of programs are there a lot of people are part of that program as well now we also run regular post graduate fellow classes and the publications and applications are there applications are going to make very easy day to day management in that regards the often problem still remains is that the number of pediatric endocrinologists in the country may be around 100 and 100 may be a over rating exaggeration cases are thousands so what do we need to do there needs to be a bridge between cases pediatricians and pediatricians with special interest and then more pediatric endocrinologists this is what we are looking at for that now we are trying to come up with a solution which hopefully will come up in the next 2 to 3 months which will help you out using a personalized intelligent emr so what it will do is that based upon your particular problem so if a child has short stature once you say short stature specific questions will come with regards to history examination this will be there for all conditions so precocious puberty delayed puberty dsd whatever 40 conditions we are developing these protocols you just have to enter this data once you enter you will ask specific questions on examination so for a delayed puberty it will ask anosmia for precocious puberty it will ask about headache so different questions will come once you answer those questions put basic data while you are examining the patient this is looking very benign simple you are just putting but what is and you may simultaneously assess bone age there so it looks very simple you are doing that but what is happening is that behind the scene algorithms are running which are then telling you this is the diagnosis this is the investigation required this is the likely treatment and then you will get a lot of output and you can then export it in the form of a proper it will give you like a proper history has been taken you will get results interpretation this is a work in progress lot of intelligent algorithms required it will take time but this is the way forward so this will allow everywhere across the country to have a state of the art quality assured sort of a management and then there could be connections with clinics as well so this is something which we are working in that direction last three days we had very intense program in the regency center for diabetes and technology and research over 30 people from across the country had come and it was a very good interaction with over 300 cases in which a lot of interactive discussion we know that it is a major grant in that perspective and that really needs to be understood and we we'll use this grant on using three group of disorders 
multiple predatory hormone deficiency, hyperprolactinemia, and AVP disorder. So we'll use, I think, 20 cases quickly to go through and see how we manage NSS. So you've seen a lot of cases of predatory in the, in the session, so it would be easy to go from there. So we talk about the HPT axis. Now what's interesting in HPT axis is all the hormones of the anterior pituitary are stimulated by the hypothalamic hormone, except for prolactin. So we've got GHRH which stimulates growth hormone, TRH which stimulates TSH, ACTH stimulates, uh, CRF uh, stimulates ACTH, and GNRH LH. So the only inhibitory factor is dopamine. Now, why is that? Because body doesn't want to lactate all the time. So you have an inhibitory pathway. When you want, you switch it off. So this is very, very relevant because if you have a lesion at the hypothalamic level, your prolactin level will go up. If you have a pituitary lesion, your prolactin will go down. So prolactin is a marker of site of a hypothalamic pituitary damage, which we saw in many of our cases as well in that regard. The second thing to remember out here, very importantly in that perspective, is that if you have radiation damage, the first hormone to be damaged on radiation is growth hormone. The second hormone is going to be uh, LH and FSH will go a bit later. ACTH is also going to be affected in a significant fashion. So growth hormone is first, followed by LH and FSH, then ACTH and TSH. So first hormone to knock down with radiation is growth hormone. Then you will have hypothalamic involvement causing precautious puberty, then delayed puberty, then ACTS deficiency. However, if you have an immunological cause like uh, infundibulitis, the first hormone to go will be ACTH. So there is a difference in terms of the pathology which will tell you which hormone is affected in that regard. Now, assessment basically, if you have two or more anterior hormone deficiency, this will call as MPHD. So growth hormone levels less. FT4 low with a TSH less than 20. This is, I've told 20 times, I think, but never forget FT4 low, TSH less than 20, that is central. It's not that TSH 10 to 20 becomes primary. Prolactin, of course, ACTH stimulated cortisol less than 550, low levels, and of course, DI is a different ballgame. So if you have DI in a pituitary case, it is not pituitary, it is hypothalamic. So if you have DI, if you have high prolactin, that is Hypothalamic, if you have low prolactin, if you have no DI, if you have early chiasmal involvement, that's pretty. So this is just the background. And we'll, uh, so there are various genes involved, and we've been discussing what cases about septo-optic dysplasia and involvement of pituitary specific phenotypes in that perspective. We'll ask this question to Dr. Rishi, I believe that will be his area of interest on that, in that regard. So we'll start with the first case, sign. So we have a 12-year-old boy who presented to us with lethargy had low free T4 levels and a low TSH for the same. Yep. Uh, had a low cortisol along with a low ACTH, so looks like a multiple pituitary hormone deficiency in this case. Uh, had a low LHFSH, so complete multiple pituitary hormone deficiency at this stage. Uh, so how do we differentiate a pituitary from a hypothalamic lesion? Dr. Rishi? I think once it's already given by Dr. Dorak in his talk, but in introductory talk, when he was saying a minute back, he was saying that to differentiate whether diabetes is dependent in there or not, or what is the prolactin level. These two things will differentiate whether it is hypothalamic or So the prolactin is low, it should be more in favor of prolactin. If the prolactin is borderline, it should be more in favor of prolactin. So in this case, the prolactin was on the lower side, it suggested more of a other scenario. So the key message, Dr. Rishi, I think that you already said. That very important again that if you have central hypothyroidism, look at MPHD. What else, Dr. Rishi? I think uh, this is the message you give low prolactin, suggests a pituitary cause. Prolactin measurement is very important, and low prolactin is not of this it has a value. So, this is classical or Sheehan syndrome. We say zero prolactin, that sort of a thing, a similar scenario relevant for pediatric practice. So, moving forward to the second case, this is a one week old boy presenting with seizures. So at the time of seizures, there is hypoglycemia with ketotic hypoglycemia, but a very low cortisol for the same and a very low growth hormone. So it looks like a multiple pituitary hormone deficiency confirmed clinically by a micro penis of length 1.8 centimeter. Sir, uh, so this is a multiple pituitary hormone deficiency uh, because all the uh, axons are there. Uh, so the pituitary hormone is 
And when you have this particular scenario where uh, clearly the cortisol position go down, they tend to have severe hypoglycemia and seizure. Now, the eye sign is uh, basically the stagnus and the uh, septoptic dysplasia, uh, which is uh, classic. And in fact, uh, they thought they could remember as to diagnose what wrong deficiency. As far as the latest GHR guidelines in 2019, only a little less than seven, seven is considered. But I have a question to you, uh, Nara, since you're the author of this uh, uh, very, very uh, you know, succinct. Uh, Random model is the classic teaching was the hypothalamic versus pituitary. Is suppose you take hypothalamus and the pituitary is destroyed, your TSH will be basically unreported. Whereas the hypothalamic, the TSH will be relatively low. So, what we were taught those days, I mean, when I was in the States, we had TRH available and we used to use TRH. And then show that if you have no rise in TSH, then it is pituitary because it's basically a current token. And so, what are your comments on that? Yes, I think that's a very important question. Now, if you look at patients with Sheehan syndrome, Dr. Rishi has got a large number of them, the TSH is never zero. Sheehan is one whose whole pituitary is necrosed, and prolactin levels are zero, but TSH will never be zero. The reason for that is bio inactive TSH. So in hypothalamic, you will have a slightly higher TSH, which is very clear because there the TSH is not glycosylated. So the chance of having TSH between 10 to 20 is more with hypothalamic, but it can still happen with pituitary because never you will have a zero TSH in most cases. So yes, very importantly, higher levels suggest hypothalamic, but if you want one test, like if I say phosphorus is a test to distinguish between uh, uh, hypophos hypoparathyroidism and vitamin D, Similarly, prolactin is a test, but yes, TSH, there will be a variation, but both of them will have bioinactive TSH. It may be low, normal, or even slightly high. So, Dr. Rishi, your comments on Sheehan with the same, because Sheehan is pretty much, very much pretty necrosis. Dr. Gallup, just sharing my experience, this is too that I can get the In 90s, when I was in the I used to be separate of TRS, WHO, so Zero TSH zero. But TSH zero is not very common. TSH will be one, two, three, four, something like that. Yeah, it is basically uh, inappropriately low for the so I think the inappropriate word is very important for low T4. The TSH yes. for primary should be very high. If TSH is below normal, it's most like TSH will be uh, 30, 40, 50, 60, something like that. I mean, if you understand uh, with my address. Yeah. So the figure of 20 that I'm talking about has come from studies which have looked into both secondary and tertiary hypothyroidism, and they found that. Did they do the average simulation? Yes, they did. Yes, and they did the imaging actually. So if you have, they also had the imaging. So somebody had an MRI lesion, somebody had a pituitary lesion. So they knew very well where they were in terms of that. And both of them ha had a higher than normal TSH also in a few cases. So this is an uh, interesting finding in that regard. I think for TRS simulation, just a different imagination. Yes, now MRI is so easily available. You will know what you're dealing with usually. So now I think this was very clear. Dr. Subhanto said that roving nystagma, the eyes will keep on roving. That is what you should look at. So nystagma and blindness, the sick one mutation. So Dr. Subhanto, I think hypoglycemia. Yeah, absolutely. With my In fact, the general message is that's the other thing is uh, you don't have to wait for oxology because growth hormone deficiency pans out later on and then they take the drug smaller. So you have a baby who's is pretty well grown. I have one such patient with midline defect. That was the other thing. The midline defect. And the eyes were not growing. All the numbers were low. And I started them on supplemental hormones, including growth hormones. So always look at the eyes, always look at the craniofacial, midfacial, and that will give you the clue. And midline defects are uh, you know, very common. And if you do an MRI, you might get a set of uh, PSIAs. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, sir.
Moving forward to the next case, now we have a 17 year old girl who was a follow up case of multiple pituitary hormone deficiency on growth hormone and thyroxine replacement. As the child came late, he was first initiated on growth hormone. Now, main concern was delayed puberty, started on estradiol. Had complaints of headache and lethargy. And when a uh, cortisol level was done, it came out to be low 74 nanomoles per liter. On MRI, we found an enlarged pituitary. So can a multiple pituitary hormone deficiency have enlarged pituitary, sir? Or is it a tumor which was missed for a long time? Yeah, I think what is very interesting is to see that the multiple pituitary hormone deficiencies evolve over time. So it starts off with one hormone and on follow-up, you pick up and you pick up more and more hormone deficiencies on follow-up. And the clue, the presence of enlarged pituitary gland is an important clue to the underlying genetic diagnosis. So you see, a lot of data is available from various Indian centers to have documented the presence of mutations in the crop and fit as important causes of a congenital hypopituitarism and GH1 and GHR which are the uh, you know, responsible mutations and isolated growth hormone mutations. The presence of enlarged pituitary gland is an important clue for the diagnosis of PROP1 and hypoplastic pituitary is an important clue for the diagnosis of PIT1. And remember, our country, the mutation behaves so funnily and in fact, there's a lot of reports in Western India where they have a state precocious puberty associated with PIT1. So I think the important message from this case is the enlarged pituitary gland is not a sign of a tumor, but it is a message to you to think in terms of a PROP1 mutation as an underlying cause for the hypopituitarism. And in this diagram, especially with the advent of the growth hormone, thyroxine, and the estrogen therapy, which has probably triggered the onset of adrenal insufficiency. So identify them early before the onset of symptoms. Periodic screening is mandatory. This is the message to this case. I think that was very nicely put. So basically, these are causes when you have congenital MPHD, don't get stopped there. There will be some causes. And now we've got NGS available. Whether it changes management is a different thing altogether, but ultimately you know more about the case. And pituitary morphology. MRI will give you a lot of picture in that regard. Uh, a 17-year-old girl, again, presenting with lethargy, had weakness, amenorrhea. Also along with that, had visual complaints, undetectable LH and FSH, but with a prolactin that is 60 at present. Low cortisol, low free T4 for the same. So what do you think, Dr. Neha, about this case? So as we can see from the biochemistry here, that this is a case of multiple pituitary hormone deficiency. So we have hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, we have low cortisol, and we have low thyroxine levels as well. So as Sir has previously pointed out, that now imaging is easily available. So every case of multiple pituitary hormone deficiency should be subjected to a MRI scan with pituitary protocol. So it is important to write MRI pituitary protocol whenever we are sending a slide for regular exam. So what do you expect based upon these findings, whether it is hypothalamic or pituitary? So since we have a uh, prolactin level of 60, so based on this prolactin, one would estimate that it is likely a hypothalamic cause and not a pituitary. But when MRI was done, what we find here is a... So you can see the white arrow placed on the MRI imaging, which is showing a thick stalk-like image. So a sagittal section is a better section to pinpoint the stalk thickening. But here also you can see slight stop thickening. So a adolescent girl with hypogonadotropic hypogonadism with stop thickening, one should always think of a autoimmune etiology. And would they have DI? Uh, with stop thickening, there is an increased possibility of DI being in picture. So one needs to monitor the electrolytes and moving also an intake chart should be. So um, this is a classically first reported as she differential of Sheehan in pregnant women. So what they found was Sheehan causes complete necrosis, no DI. Then they found some of these ladies had DI also. Then they realized it was actually an autoimmune process which caused that. But now we see this also in adolescence. So stock thickening is a big message out. You see big stock if you see here. And Sian did a wonderful presentation on pituitary imaging in the onset course. This is very, very thick. Dr. Rishi. Mm -hmm. Small comment about Shiaz. You are talking one sleep driving of the patient Shiaz, and eventually that patient conceived. And then we realized it's not Shiaz, it's a woman having a second. And that this can change over time. That is another scenario. Why it is not prolactin tumor? Okay. The level of prolactin is not high for that. That is the first message there. So for a prolactin producing tumor to cause MPHD, it will be a big lesion. 
So that big lesion with a platelet will be very high. Neha was asking why didn't we think of a diluted sample? So this, your point is true, whether it is a hook effect. But if you look at this MRI, this is not like a, this, you're thinking more like a macro adenoma, this looks actually like a thickened stock. And when we looked on the other image, you got a better picture. But your point is valid. And we said that if your prolactin is not that high and you have got a large lesion, think of a hook effect. That is very, very valid point. But the overall picture was different in this scenario. So Neha, what are the messages? We should always consider radio diagnosis of the cellular region in all the cases of multiple pituitary hormone deficiency, and especially in a female patient with young adolescent and autoimmune etiology should be kept in mind. Uh, thank you, Dr. Neha. Moving forward to the next case, we have a 15-year-old girl presenting to us with headache. Now, this was low grade, but suddenly increased. And thereafter, the girl went into shock. Sodium was low, potassium was normal in this case, and cortisol and free T4 also came out to be low. So what can be the cause of this sudden, in sudden increase in headache and thereafter going into shock with isolated hyponatremia? And another finding was there was there was also ophthalmoplegia. So the, there was ophthalmoplegia. So I think now we are closer to the diagnosis. I think that that works out very clearly. <laughs> 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 This, this goes more in favor of uh, any attack with shock. And here, what we are saying that potential is low, so we, yeah. that is again a depicted point. And then all these hormones, certain physical deficiencies, cellular onset, thermal media, will emerge from the pituitary. So, what you have to do? One, one thing for this give fluids, price, and esterols. Then, whatever. So I think this is a very important message that pituitary apoplexy is an emergency. There is an adenoma which suddenly bleeds because of whatever reason. It swells up and when it swells up, normally pituitary enlarges in the superior direction. But if you suddenly increase to break the bone boundary, go into the uh, cavernous sinus, cause third, fourth, sixth palsy. And that's why you will have features of hormone deficiency along with pressure effect. And that is why ophthalmoplegia with shock, headache, first thing, pituitary, apoplexy, and steroids become very important in this setting and that becomes relevant. So Dr. Rishi, key messages from that point? I, I think I, I, I like one thing actually when you are introducing me to this one thing, one thing about my introduction is that I have a story And I have learned a lot from my patients, but very recently a patient in a few more days back a pituitary macro adenoma, ionuria, 20 milligram, and then suddenly she did a messiah. She came out of five, six years. What happened there? And I was looking at the products of the summer, and I didn't know how to write it. Because of financial reasons or lack of awareness, whatever, she did not have that. I was upset because macro product adenoma is totally treatable to this. We got MRI and everything that, and it was disappeared. It was auto infection. And the other point also is that so don't. Never, so, the moral of the story is never get angry or get this. <laughs> And don't start in a high dose scavalgoli. If you start high dose in the immediate phase, you will cause this apoplexy. So, this is something which also you have to do. Yeah, I know. So, this, this is what happened. Yeah. In fact, it makes it better to start with bromocryptin in these cases. Yeah. If there's a very large tumor. Uh, moving forward to the next case, we have a 16 year old girl presenting to us with delayed puberty, height of 144 centimeter, undetectable gonadotropins. Uh, prolactin came out to be slightly high at 32, but again with a low cortisol. So, Dr. Subrata, what do you think of this case? Short stature, low LHFSH. Mm. So this looks like hypothalamic uh, cause, central cause for delayed puberty. Cortisol is low. Prolactin is uh, detectable and reasonable. So it's not high, it's not causing the low energy. So essentially, you have low gonadic proteins, so low cortisol, and you have short stature. Because uh, at uh, 12 years, you should be 150 centimeters. Yeah. You should triple your uh, birth weight 
birth height at uh, 12 years. So this is FPH, and this is the MRI. Okay, so what is it? it looks like some uh, rapid cyst. Yeah, so this is enhancing. Yeah. And uh, so every cyst should not enhance. So we saw so discuss this in detail. So this is a congenital MKG due to rat case cyst. So I think this so, is the so basically this is a as say sometimes even congenital defects can evolve over time and uh, it may manifest much later. Yeah. So did you will have a glaucoma situation just done on this show? Yeah, the work up was done. She had all the deficiencies and all the factors. So this, this was basically sure. a multiple pituitary hormone deficiency. Now, management of course is growth hormone, thyroxin, cortisol. The cortisol requirement and thyroid requirement is lower compared to a primary adrenal and a primary thyroid deficiency in central. And if required, AGP is given. But once you start treatment, if you start growth hormone, you expect cortisol inactivation to happen. So you may precipitate adrenal insufficiency. You may worsen thyroid deficiency because it may unmask hypothyroidism. That is important. Very importantly, when you start thyroxine, you may also precipitate adrenal insufficiency. And once you start, uh, unmasking of DI may also happen if you start cortisol. This we discussed that if a patient with MPAB on steroids suddenly develops DI, that is because of cortisol. You are unmasking that. And if you give estradiol, your IGF, and this is what Bayes was talking about. If you give uh, IGF oral estradiol, you will cause growth hormone resistance and your TBG will go up. So you will unmask hypothyroidism. So one treatment may affect the other. This you need to be aware of. But I think uh, uh, underscoring that most important thing, which I think you may have in all subsequent cases, is if it's MPH, do not start. That's the biggest message. So, so moving forward to the next case, we have a 16 year old girl diagnosed as a case of multiple pituitary hormone deficiency, received growth hormone, thyroxine, estrogen, now complains of lethargy and weakness. And we had a morning cortisol of 156 and a synactin stimulation test of 620. But the girl presented with fever, shock, and a low sodium. So can a low sodium present with a stimulated cortisol level that is more than normal? I think this is a quickly that is highlighted in this case that in what we have to remember in this child is similar that just the child is not. The child is on growth hormone, child is on thyroxine. These are the two drugs which can precipitate or underlies cortisol deficiency or increase the requirement of cortisol requirement. Secondly, if it is observed that this girl has been started on estrogen, estrogen has an important effect on the cortisol binding hormone production. It increases the production of CBG and causes a false elevation in the levels of both creation as well as stimulated cortisol. So, what happens? Your your biochemical tests are fully new. Despite having a cortisol deficiency, all the biochemical tests are fully new as if there is no cortisol deficiency. Right. So this is a situation where you should rely on a clinical and uh, uh, history rather than going into the uh, the uh, factor of looking into numbers. I think the message from this case is estrogen can cause a false elevation in CBG and a false normal level and then prove us as if there is no cortisol deficiency but there may be other than having a deficiency and we should immediately start this treatment on cortisol deficiency. I think that's a very big message and clinical pointers of central adrenal insufficiency, weakness, lethargy, all those things are very difficult to pick up. So very important message there. Uh, moving forward to the next case, we have now a four-year-old boy with multiple pituitary hormone deficiency on thyroxine, now started on growth hormone at 25 micrograms, have, has, four, uh, has free T4, which is very low at present. So can there be any cause of the same? So this, uh, this case of a four-year-old boy with MPHD who is already receiving thyroxine supplementation again reinforces the physiology evolving around the anterior pituitary hormones which tells us that when a child is on growth hormone supplementation, the thyroid metabolism is increased. So that unmasks the thyroid deficiency and that is leading to a low peak thyroxine level even though the child is on hormone supplementation. So the message from this case is that growth hormone 
completely unmasked the hypothyroid cell, and that should be considered why replacing the thyroid in this case. So always remember the interaction. These three hormones can cause havoc here and there. And the primary point, low FT4, TSH below 20, start cortisol, look at cortisol before you treat. Second scenario, very common hyperprolactinemia. So basically, hyperprolactinemia, most commonly we think is because of pituitary tumor. There, the levels are usually more than 200. That's what we're talking about that, Dr. Sanjay. You can have a stock compression because of an infundibular lesion. You can have a germinoma. The levels typically are less than 100. You can have a hypothalamic lesion, radiotherapy, again, less than 100. So prolactin levels are very important indicators. Very importantly, pregnancy can cause hyperprolactinemia. The most common cause of secondary amenorrhea, the most common cause of galactoria would be pregnancy. So I think this is something you should always remember. And we'll discuss that. Drugs can of course cause up to 200. So levosulprite, domperidone, antipsychotics. Often these drugs will cause very high levels we see very commonly. Hypothyroidism up to 100. And liver disease, renal failure up to 30. Not really high in that perspective. We've already discussed two analytical errors in the morning, in the afternoon session. The effect of macroprolactin, where there is no prolactin and you say it is high, do a pegylated study. And hook effect, where you have a very high prolactin and you say no prolactin, do a dilution study. So this we already discussed in the lab today. Very important issue of what Dr. Sanjay was talking about, prolactinoma versus non-functional adenoma. Non-functional prolactin will be less than 100. Size will be usually big and your symptoms will be much more. So if you have isolated prolactin symptoms, small lesion prolactin, very high, that is more like a prolactinoma in that scenario. So if your level is less than 100 and the size becomes 10 to 20, it should be 200 to 1000 and more than 20 would be more than 1000. This is a slight correlation between the size of pituitary lesion and the level of prolactin. So you should then consider that in that scenario and larger lesions with lower level. Now this is what the question was. Cystic lesion, undifferentiated lesion, okay. And of course, non functional lesion. This is what you need to look at. Uh, now we had a 14 year old boy who presented to us with gynecomastia at breast stage 2, TV of 12 ml, pubic hair of 3, but had a LH which was 1.8 and a testosterone of 120. So, correlating with the pubic hair and testicular volume staging. But can a prolactin of 120 not cause hypogonadism in this case? Uh, the MRI also came out to be normal. So, Dr. Rishi, a prolactin of 120 not causing hypogonadism. It suppresses GNRS. So, because of this, definitely the expect to be low LH and the chest or testosterone. We are not seeing here. There is some mismatch. So there is a contradiction. So, immunoactivity and bioactivity are not matching. That's what we are looking at. So, that of course could be the macroprolactin which we discussed. And pegylated study will help in that scenario. So, again, if you have high prolactin, no symptoms, think of macroprolactin. This is a message. Again, to highlight this. How, how does Direct effect of production on GNRH. Direct. GNRH pulse frequency becomes less. This prevention, uh, uh, the lab people do prevention. They can do, yeah. So it's like a chemical. Like, uh, no, 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 I, I try to understand prevention. Hmm. So they attach something and then they do yeah. it. It's like that, but not the. Lab uh, routine labs will not do it. You'll have to ask SRL, especially you have to talk to specific labs. But we, this is a very rare scenario. We need to be aware of it. No, but I think it is very important to do regulation. About five, six years ago, we were not doing it in the forum. And then I brought it to the notice and one of the adult vendors, who is a master in security, we had to speak. And now we're getting the regulation done. But there is a very good lab, outstanding lab, Royal Duvedi. It has, you know, all the people from Bengal will know. And they've been doing regulation the last 10 years. So the important thing is, it is a facility. It is very important to distinguish, especially in the high levels of prolactin, and as to what the significance. How is it done? We won't discuss that. <laughs> that is up to the lab. <laughs>
So moving forward to the next case, we have a 13 year old girl presenting with headache and visual complaints. Dada, headache and visual complaints. Prolactin uh, of 60. Prolactin of 60 is not good enough. So, Unless it is the hook effect that we were talking about. So this is the MRI. Labeled as a pituitary mass. This we discussed. We got the case also in the on site course. Achha. Similar case. Okay. Visual complaints are there. Visual complaints are there. And this is the pituitary. It looks big, but it doesn't look monstrous. Did you do it? I mean, uh, there was no. Uh, I'm very poor at MRI. So, is, was there any circumscribed tumor like this, or was the whole? It was, thing a, diffu thing? It was a diffuse enlargement. Diffuse But it was coming very close to the chiasma. If you had looked at those sections, you would okay. see very close to chiasma. But it is a whole pituitary which is enlarged. So, is it compressing the stalk and producing? It is just abutting. And okay. Then, okay. So this is not a focal lesion, it's a diffuse lesion. But this is a uh, completely enlarged. So maybe there is uh, some other uh, you know, component of the pituitary gland, which is hypertrophy. That points to you know, a thyrotrophy. So, yeah, so uncontrolled hypothyroidism. We said 50 to 100, and this is the absolutely right diagnosis. And we had the girl. And this girl was seen by an endocrinologist who had advised for surgery, IGF-1, a lot of other things had already been done. And she came, to, I think in this period, the pituitary is already shrunk. So this is an important message that you may have a thyrotroph hyperplasia, which can cause a mimic like a mass patient. So there's another thing, when you, uh, this, is, this looks like one of those chrysalis of pupa or something. But oftentimes when you have this crucible-like uh, 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 cellular Jessica. In, in children who are precocious students, you will see a bump like this, and the pituitary mass is increased, and that's different, that's normal. Yeah, that's but the here, same. This is the same thing. If yeah. you look in the sagittal uh, coronal section, mm -hmm. you will see the same sort of a thing. It was not looking like a lesion, it was like a, just a bump which was there. Exactly. I think it's, it's more to it. Never drive a car from right. We have a left sided driving, so never drive a car from right side. So, whenever you see this product, before ordering anything, just look at that. Yes. Just look at that. And this, the, this is the basic chirurgical studies. I think that's a very important message. Huh. Moving forward to the next case. Now, we had a 16 year old girl presenting with galactodia. So, we clinically expected the prolactin to be very high. But it came out to be 34, only 34 in this case. The girl also had headache and vomiting. Now, on MRI, we saw this lesion. So, what, are, what can be the cause of this discorrelation between the clinical parameters and the biochemical parameters? Yeah, thank you. I think uh, it has been very beautifully mentioned that in the case of a uh, tumor of macroprolactinoma, as the size of the tumor increases, the, the level of the prolactin has to go up. Here there is a total discordance between the level of the prolactin and the size of the tumor on the pituitary gland. So I think this is a clear case for us to look into what is really preventing this child from mounting a level of high, high prolactin. Is there a cystic or an undifferentiated lesion? Or is there a non functional lesion that is compressing the parasite and compressing the parasite and causing the temperature? Or most likely, what is the case is the case of a hook effect. As described in literature, you expect a serial increase in the level of the hormone with an increase in the size of the lesion. But when there is a hooking down of the level as shown beautifully in this graph, you have this sort of a picture that you have a falsely low prolactin level and a high size of the tumor which is producing lot of prolactin. This is because the antigen levels overwhelm the antibody level and cause a false decrease in the antigen antibody complexes which are not picked up. So the solution for this is to run the tea sample again in dilution. The concentration of the antigen is brought down when you run it in dilution. So this with this synchrony between the antigen levels and the antibody levels are brought down when you run in dilution. And in a repeat assessment, the dilution was done. I think the level was picked up and it was found to be high. I think this case highlights the important problem of husband and wife relationship between the endocrinology department and the biochemistry department. <laughs> Wait, there should be harmony. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, moving forward to the next case, we had a 17-year-old girl with amenorrhea for three months. Breast for pubic hair for undetectable gonadotropins. Prolactin came out to be 500. Uh, so clinically correlating with the level of prolactin with undetectable gonadotropins. So, so Neha. Yeah. Yes. So going back to the first slide, which Anwar has already discussed, the most common cause of amenorrhea in a girl is pregnancy. So we have high prolactin levels, low gonadotropins. Next, we are looking on the estrogen, which is high, which again reinforces pregnancy as the cause of this biochemical picture. So best is to do a HCG level in urine or in blood. And HCG was done here, which was quite high, which confirms the diagnosis of pregnancy. Always think of pregnancy in such a scenario. So that's what Bill was also talking about. Even if you have hypothalamic amenorrhea, do a HCG. That is a very relevant message. The big message is that HCG before MRI in a high prolactin. We have seen even the fellows saw yes. one case and this prolactin was high and then pregnancy was diagnosed later on. So this is a different scenario. <coughs> uh, moving forward to the next case, we have a 14-year-old boy presenting to us with headache. Again, a prolactin that is mildly raised at 80 and this is what the MRI shows us. So, Dr. Rishi, please enlighten us on this case. Is it a functional, non-functional, that question basically? See, as I shared with you, uh, 80 is probably the reason with the level of stop. And it will give us an HP word. It may be uh, most likely one function category. So it's a large lesion, and you have got not enough prolactin. If you are much in doubt, you can think of doing a dilution study. But if I go back, this clearly looks like there is a peripheral rim of tissue, which is already there, which suggests that this is not a pituitary lesion. It is coming above below. That is what it is. So this is most likely a cranium. It is very important to differentiate if it is a prolactinoma, you give cabargurin in this point. But if it is a cranio, you will need a much more no, robustic surgical approach. Yeah. 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 Yes. The tumor that you mentioned from uh, I understand you were more than 100 is tumor, but you categorically said more than 200. But there are a number of versions. So it's more than 200. Yeah. Or here it is classically less than 100. This is very classical. We'll finally quickly go through the AVP pathway. We all know that if you have a lesion in the hypothalamic axis, you will have diabetes insipidus in which you have dilute urine and concentrated blood. You can have congenital lesions, but mostly it is acquired. Acquired DI is a hallmark of a pathology. You may miss germinoma. You may miss other conditions. So this is important. Nephrogenic DI is usually congenital presenting at 6 months to 12 months of age with Dehydration, failure to thrive, developmental delay. That is what is common. Evaluation of polyuria we discussed in detail. If you have polyuria and you have included common things, do a water deprivation test. A urinary osmolality less than 300 DI, do an AVP response. 300 to a more than 800 rules out DI. And then you can carry forward in terms of evaluation. This was discussed in much detail just yesterday. Very importantly, central DI or work doesn't finish. Do MRI at diagnosis and follow up because you may pick up lesions later on as well. So now we'll quickly go forward. Uh, this is a 10 year old girl with a diagnosis of craniopharyngioma, had neurosurgery, went into polyuria at 5 ml per kg per hour, was given vasopressin to check this polyuria, went into seizures with a sodium of 128. Sir, to correct this GI, the patient was given vasopressin. But can, is it possible to go into 128 with the same dose of vasopressin? Basically, if you see the cycle, initially there is transient DI, then there is SIDH, and then there is uh, permanent DI. So, so the triple phase. So this transient DI, there is no need to start really intervening. Just do it is good enough. Monitoring is, is important. And I think when they will slip from DI to SIT, you will have to, you know, it's like timing the market. You cannot do that. So you just watch carefully. Let the SIT uh, ex uh, express itself. And then you manage it by restricting fluids and other things. So the important message in this case is it's very dynamic. 
And I think Neha is an expert on that, and she should have been given the question. She must have managed that oh, in three months about 500 of these. So I would like her comment. Uh, not exactly 500, but five such cases. And all the five cases we have seen that the turning point, the studying in book, the triple phase response is quite easy. But when we see on the picture, we cannot comment when the DI will change into SIADH. And that is very crucial for the patients. And neurosurgeons who have spent hours in the surgery, they will not like if you mismanage their patients. So it is better that we observe, wait and watch for the poly area to settle down. And if there is Hyponatremia, which is causing sign symptoms, then only we should poke our fingers, otherwise just we watch and take the vaccine in such cases. The on follow up this child is now developed hyponatremia, lethargy, and weakness. So suddenly his DI is gone. So, what do you think of Subrato is happening? Yeah, this is actually a very important concept that DI is masked by cortisol deficiency. In fact, there was this one uh, case which, you, with your kind permission, I will talk about a 12 year old girl who presented with uh, severe hyponatremia, like a SIDA, premature And uh, well, even before I got there, the intensivist, adult intensivist, had given the person saline this bad or not. So, the moment I saw that, I basically stopped everything. I sent off the labs and uh, assuming this to be an MPHD, started cortisol first with a habit reporting just like that. And you know, that was low. Cortisol just like that. It was low. So, I started cortisol, and guess what? The DI was a mask. And then for a sodium of 110, it swung. It was swinging. I mean, with somebody on 3% and I stopped that. And that is a very important message that cortisol deficiency can unmask, uh, can mask. conceal, mask DI. And once you do the replacement, DI is So, as I said, if your calcitriol requirement comes down in hypoparathyroidism, insulin requirement comes down in diabetes, blood pressure requirement comes down in hypertension. And your AVP comes down in this thing, think of cortisol. So think thyroid to think cortisol. These are the four basic situations you have to think. So now a three-month-old girl with dehydration and ducky skin. Hypernatremia in this case with a low urine osmolality. Concentrated blood, dilute urine. Advised a water deprivation test in this case. Went into seizures. Thereafter found to have intraventricular hemorrhage. So Dr. Himchan, do you agree with this line of management? I think the writing is on the wall. When you have a concentrated blood and such an inappropriately dilute urine, I think the writing of diabetes and sepsis is written in the face of this blood. I think what the deprivation test was like pushing her osmolarity further and pushing her into these concentrations. So I think uh, it is very. So this was like a suicidal move, basically. Homicide. Homicidal. Not suicidal. It's not homicidal. And, and guess what? In the renal algorithm, in the renal algorithms, they have, unless the sodium is more than 150, um, we will do a water deprivation. But it's clear, 145 and above, when a serum osmolality of more than 300, we do not do a water deprivation. I reviewed the case report in which they said we did a water deprivation with a sodium of 170. So that is like, no, this is a true case. It was sent for report also, like they reported also. And, so, and then patient developed seizure. So this is from that report. Not from our place. <laughs> and they published it also to show. <laughs> this is like a, a series of uh, the series on rapamyolysis in the management of type 1 diabetes DKA. If you poorly manage it, if they have hypo, uh, you know, hypophosphatemia, which is so wrong, they'll get rapamyolysis. But guess what? We had five cases of rapamyolysis. <laughs> Uh, moving forward to the next case, this is a 12 year old boy with central DI for two years. A normal MRI at baseline started on vasopressin, uh, DDAVB, had seizures, headache, a sodium of 142 in this case. So, uh, what do you think of this case, uh, Dr. Neha? Why did the child suddenly go into seizures? This concept has already been described in the initial slide in which Abraxar has clearly pointed out that even in the case of central DEI, if you have a normal imaging at the baseline, it should be periodically monitored. So it's six monthly for the initial two years, 
and then depending upon the finding, it can be monitored subsequently. So this case had a normal MRI at diagnosis, so a six monthly routine monitoring should have been done in this case, otherwise the lesion was missed. Uh, thank you, Dr. Neha. Uh, moving forward to the final case from DI. It was a three-year-old boy presenting with polyuria, had a high sodium, again a low osmolality, but in this case had rash. So what would be the diagnostic test, test to diagnose this clinically, Dr. Shubrata? Clinically? No, radiologically. <laughs> Simple radiology. Simple radiology, take an X-ray of the skull, lateral, and you will see little holes in it, and that will be suggestive of LCH. Now the nomenclature has changed, and uh, localized heterocytosis, diffuse, etc. But yes, that. And uh, so, of course, so it's two to five years, always think of histiocytosis. Now, he was planned for chemotherapy, advised hydration. So, you're giving fluid on one hand, ADP on the other. The child will have a lot of problems. So, how do you manage in this scenario? There will be fluid overload, which may happen. So, what is the best way to manage in this scenario? I think you can give the ADP infusion because you can regulate that. Yeah. And that too, uh, see, during chemotherapy, what these guys do, they do this uh, vibration, dehydration, and they pour liters of fluid. Now, the other way of looking at it, is since any of this patient has a uh, uh, PI, just stop everything. No, so funny, so funny, though, yeah, okay. This sodium will slowly settle down because if you don't give water or give less water, sodium goes up. If you give more water, the kidneys are working to the center, so get rid of the water and you will have the so without doing anything hectic, just monitoring the fluid balance yeah. and, and the amount of fluid. Ins and out, you don't output, ins and out, you keep on it. So, again, LCH very important two to five years, and then skeletal survey crucial, low dose DDAP with uh, required in that chemotherapy. Final section on SIADH, remember SIADH is opposite of DI, you have concentrated urine and a dilute serum. So, your serum basically what you're looking at is serum osmolality less than 275, urinary osmolality more than 100, but you have to exclude adrenal, renal, thyroid, and liver abnormality. This is a, sick, a diagnosis of exclusion, and you have to exclude hypovolemia because hypovolemia shifts the curve towards the left side, and no diuretic use and no response to serine. So SIADH is every uvolemic hyponatremia is not SIADH is the key message. Uh, we had a 14-year-old boy with drowsiness, uvolemic, a sodium which is 100 and a urine osmolality which is 300. So diagnosed as a case of SIADH right away and advised fluid restriction. So do, do you uh, agree with the line of management, Rishi, sir? I think, again, uh, what Dr. Akar mentioned, we have to rule out adrenal uh, deficiency, we have to rule out hypothyroidism, diuretic kidney, and uh, any fluid restriction. When, when all this then I think we need a very tiny to find out what is the cause, whether it is central or some lesion in the lung or something. So, we look at it. So, there was so multiple pituitary hormone deficiency. So, very much you have to exclude deficiencies before you diagnose SIDH. So, we had an 11 year old boy with traumatic brain injury admitted in the ICU, improved with management, but had seizures again on day two with a sodium of 125 now they were uh, the icu team called us with a referral that how can they differentiate between sidh and cerebral salt wasting in this case so how do we proceed in this case dr okay. hemchan very good i think this is a classical case of hyponatremia in a sick child with a neurological problem remember the three musketeers sidh cerebral salt wasting and pi inappropriate because it was not inappropriate, they made the two distinctions coming to our mind with SAADH and cerebral salt wasting. SAADH salt wasting, the important differentiating tool is clinically look at the volume status. In a child with SAADH, you don't have any signs of dehydration. It's a state of new volumic state. There is salt wasting, there is pouring out of sodium and water from the kidneys, so the children are new children and dehydrated. I think that is a very important uh, differentiating point. 
And second important thing, differentiating points, it is very simple in the class. We could be if there is pouring out of urine, it supports the diagnosis of cerebral sarcoidism. If the urine output is on the lower side, think in terms of acid. Of course, biochemical parameters like urine, sodium, etc., will be very important too. The thing is, I see to the K would be the uric acid. Uric acid is one important metabolite which leads to an indirect reflection of the volume status of the cell. So when you have a child with very low uric acid levels, that supports the diagnosis of SAA cause. But the important message from this piece is uric acid. Uric acid low suggests a diagnosis of SAA cause. So the SAA leads, the important thing is to prevent it. Anticipate situations where they are likely to occur. Prevent it. And if it has occurred, use judicious load management and prevent it from processing. We will see. So I have two important uh, comments which I want to share. One is I have a normal graph, which I think we have to... Uh, you know, yes, upwards, uh, which I want to... I'm sure you have it. I can send it to you. You can please share with them. Yeah. It uh, helps from an endocrine perspective because I just use a normal graph and suddenly I know where I stand. That is one. Second is in water balance. It's always intake output, intake output, or anything. Because you have to be compulsive about it because you want to see how much. Like in CSW, tons of urine being passed. Whereas in SIDH, it's not. Don't look at serum sodium, immunum sodium, they'll be all high in both the cases. But having said that, the hospitality can help you a little bit, but ultimately it will take output and just by judicial fluid management, you can uh, overcome. And the second point is that unfortunately, this is the way. You'll have a sodium of 118, 120 with uh, you know lots of urine coming out. You keep giving silly. And then a point comes to whether to, you know, how much fluids to give. And those are some challenges which, in fact, may not be facing right now because she encounters self salt wasting a lot. And sometimes you're just changing your tail because you are giving more salt, more fluid. And still, the sodium is not coming. It's a challenge. In fact, I'm not an expert in managing such cases, but from my experience in the last 15 days, there was an adult case with traumatic brain injury, and we had to give nearly 11 liters of fluid in 24 hours. So that was a surprising point for me how much fluid to give. But because the intensivists have been managing such cases, so they have told me that they have gone up to like 11, 12 liters in a day to change the sodium value. So they can go that way. I think this is finally the last case which separates us from dinner. So Dr. Sanjay, you will ask in the dinner only now. <laughs> so this is the last case for Dr. Neha. This was a 13-year-old girl with a diagnosis of tubercular meningitis presenting with uh, drowsiness. Low sodium, low urine, uh, ur low urine, high urine osmolarity. So a low sodium with a high urine osmolarity, but the doctor, referring doctor, already excluded cortisol and thyroid hormone deficiency. Was diagnosed as a case of SIDH, but here also treated with tolvaptan. So what do you think of this case with a child being treated with tolvaptan? As we can see, this is a case of a tubercular meningitis. So this child has a background diagnosis which should be responsible for the sodium-related disorder. So jumping on to tolvaptan was not a right choice. We should have first managed the intake output fluid in this case. And as you will explain in the algorithm of sodium management here, we can go step by step depending on whether the sodium disorder is an acute or chronic and whether it is symptomatic or asymptomatic. And accordingly, we can follow the algorithm given on the screen. So I think, again, Bactins in acute situation is not a very good drug. Only in adults, chronic, you can use it. Not at all in reverses because it will cause rapid rise 